Hello. Today we're considering No Man is an Island by John Donne. Before we start, if you haven't yet subscribed to our channel, it would be greatly appreciated if you would. Thank you so much. I have the writing here, so let's start. No man is an island entire of itself. Every man is a piece of the continent, a part of the main. If a clod be washed away by the sea, Europe is the less, as well as if a promontory were, as well as if a manner of thy friends or of thine own were. Any man's death diminishes me because I am involved in mankind and therefore never send to know for whom the bell tolls. It tolls for thee. So this piece, and you may have noticed I used the word piece today. So those that have watched other videos we make, I usually refer to poem. As I usually say, I have the poem right here, so let's start. However, I deliberately used piece of writing because although usually the piece of writing is presented as a poem in lines, and that's the way that we're going to approach it today. It actually started as a piece of prose writing that was transformed into a poem, given its poetic rhythmic qualities. So it's a really interesting piece. And that's why I deliberately said writing. And also, it gives us two of the most famous lines in English literature. No man is an island. And also, for whom the bell tolls. The latter being used by Ernest Hemingway for a title of one of his novels. So it's a fascinating piece. Let's start unpacking it. Although it often appears in anthologies and as a poem, actually it is a prose piece done wrote in a religious text as a meditation. No man is an island argues because we all belong to the whole human race, we should feel a sense of loss at every death because it has taken something away from mankind. That the funeral bell that tolls for another person's death also tolls for us because it marks the death of a part of us. The writing is also a memento mori, a reminder that we will die one day. The power of the passage is in the language Dunn chooses to use. Dunn wrote this in his final years, in 1623. What we have is someone at the peak of their writing. Somebody who has lived a full life and wishes to share his thoughts and feelings with us. At the time of writing, Dunn was gravely ill and death and the frailty of the human body and what will become of us, is there an afterlife? All these deep questions were at the forefront of his mind. In 1623, Dunn fell ill with a fever. While he recovered, he wrote the devotions upon emergent occasions and the often quoted no man is an island line and for whom the bell tolls comes from the 17th meditation in Dunn's devotions. So let's start with a line by line analysis of this piece. In line one, man is generic, meaning man and woman. The speaker uses a metaphor comparing a man to an island entire of itself. He argues no one is entirely isolated or disconnected like an island is. Every man is a piece of the continent, a part of the main, the mainland. 
lines three and four continue the metaphor. Although an island is separate in one sense, it is still part of something greater, like a continent. For example, Great Britain and Europe. In lines five to nine, the speaker takes the island metaphor, then develops it, comparing a man with a piece of land. On line five, he says, if a clod, a piece of earth, is washed away by the sea, the rest of the land is the lesser for it. Dunn argues that although the loss of a clod of land might be considered insignificant by some people, it would be missed as much as a promontory, a large piece of land that juts out to the sea, being washed away. To emphasise his point, Dunn uses hyperbole, exaggeration and comparison. If a clod be washed away by the sea, Europe is the less, as well as if a promontory were. Using land to represent humankind is fitting in a religious text, as it alludes to the book of Genesis, when God makes man from clay, earth or soil. In line five, the sea symbolises the destruction, time, death and nature wreak on humanity, that man lives a relatively short time on earth. Juxtaposing the tiny clod with the gigantic promontory suggests that death is a great leveller that takes the rich and powerful as well as the poor and weak. In lines 8 and 9, Dunn develops this argument and makes it more pertinent, relevant to the reader. Using direct address, thy and thine, makes this connection with the reader. Dunn argues that the clod of earth would be sorely missed as much as if your friend's manor or your manor were washed away by the sea. Here, manor means an estate of land. Referring to a disaster shared with a friend develops the theme of our connectedness with others. And losing land to the ravages of the sea was not a rare event and Dunn would have been fully aware of the encroachments of the sea particularly on the east coast of England places like Norfolk where whole tracts of land whole villages could disappear within decades sometimes within days and weeks following storms also, like nowadays, rivers would often flood, causing large-scale destruction. So Dunn uses images and metaphors readers will relate to and easily understand, possibly because they were victims and had experienced similar catastrophes themselves. In lines 10 to 13, the speaker ditches the extended metaphor and speaks plainly and directly to ensure everyone understands his important message. Dunn states, the death of one person diminishes, lessens and weakens mankind because we are all connected. Even if sometimes we fail to realize it, we are. In line 11, Involved means connected. The speaker is connected with the rest of humanity. Lines 12 and 13 bring the piece to its logical conclusion, signalled by therefore. Here the speaker assumes a preaching tone as he instructs us that when we hear a church bell toll marking the death of someone, we should not send to know, ask who it is ringing for, because the bell is ringing for us. Not literally, but metaphorically, we have died a little, because the world is much poorer by an other person's death. The preaching tone is achieved through the imperative command phrase, never ask to know. Placing these lines at the piece's end 
makes a bigger impact and indicates the message's importance. The final line consists of monosyllabic words that add impact and make it memorable. It tolls for the Placing the as the last word ensures we know this message is directed squarely at us. The speaker adopting an instructional preaching tone as if he is delivering a sermon is fitting because by now, by the time this poem was written, John Donne had been ordained a priest in the Church of England. Any man's death diminishes me, because I am involved in mankind, and therefore never send to know for whom the bell tolls. It tolls for thee. John Donne belongs to a school of writers known as the metaphysical poets. So let's find out a little about the metaphysical poets. Although originally written as prose, it has the typical features of a metaphysical poem. For example, the speaker applies logic to build an argument and uses familiar objects as comparisons to make abstract ideas easier to understand. The writing builds to a conclusion, therefore is used, with a plainly written yet striking image to make it memorable. Using first-person voice, me and I, makes the poem personal and intimate, as if the speaker shares his thoughts and feelings with the reader. Second-person pronouns thy and thine makes the poem feel like the speaker is speaking directly to us and sharing his innermost thoughts. The tone is meditative, reflective, and earnest as it deals with important themes. It is a great example of how plain, simple words can communicate complex ideas. The poem is located nowhere because it deals with universal abstract themes. John Donne was a talented writer of prose and verse and a fine deliverer of sermons. He is considered the first metaphysical poet a style of poetry that uses elaborate and novel metaphors that often reference his day's scientific discoveries. His genius for original, intellectually complex poetry influenced poetry for the next hundred years. Then he fell out of favour until the mid-20th century when T.S. Eliot championed his work and Dunn still influences today's poets. And because we know that Dunn is writing as a priest, we can confidently say that the speaker and the writer are one and the same. And let's examine in a little more detail Dunn's approach to writing. The piece superbly demonstrates Dunn's approach to writing. Here, he takes a single idea, then unpacks it, using metaphors to make the complex idea accessible to the reader. Then he develops the idea and takes it to its logical conclusion. The central metaphor of land and an island is extended over several lines. Since nobody lives or exists alone, and we are all part of something greater, each individual person is like a part of the mainland or a piece of a bigger continent, rather than an island nation that is self-sufficient and cut off from the rest. His early poems circulated in manuscripts in the 1590s, when he was still a young man in his 20s, fresh out of university, and many, are devoted to frank and humorous discussions of sex. In his pre-priesthood days, to the young Dunn, sex was just a natural part of relationships and of life. However, as he grew older, he turned to religion and was ordained a priest of the Church of England. 
he would become Dean of St Paul's Cathedral, the old St Paul's Cathedral, later destroyed in the Fire of London in 1666. Therefore, his later poems concentrate on religious themes and his relationship with God. Let's look at No Man is an Island's form and structure. As one might expect with a transition of prose writing into poetry, the metre lacks uniformity and there is no rhyme scheme. However, lines 2, 4, 6 and 9 consist of five syllables, lending structure to the piece. In lines 7 and 8, anaphora, a rhetorical device that involves repeating a phrase, cements the writing and makes the piece sound like a sermon. As well as if a promontory were, as well as if a manner of thy friends or of thine own were. Enjambment, run on lines, makes the writing flow as if the speaker is having a conversation with us. Any man's death diminishes me because I am involved in mankind. The piece reflects Dunn's Christian convictions and beliefs that we are all equal before God. The seemingly most weak and insignificant person is connected to God's love and is part of his grand design, even if it may not be revealed or apparent to us. Dunn reminds us of our duty to care for others, to help those outside our immediate circle of family and friends. Like the metaphor he uses, this moral duty extends to the vulnerable and also to strangers. Thank you so much for watching this video. I hope you found it interesting and useful. If you did, please hit the like button below. Also, check out our other videos on writing and textual analysis. And if you haven't yet subscribed to our channel, it would be greatly appreciated if you would. Thank you so much again. Until next time, write well.